Isn't it time we become better acquainted? Well, have you ever had someone come to you and say, I've known you, I've known of you, but I've never had the opportunity to really get to know you. If you come to my house, we love to play a certain game and quite a few of the church functions we've been engaging in to tell the truth. It's our little version of this, and that's where we ask you to tell us three things about yourself, two that are not true, and one that is. And we get to guess which one is the real truth about you. It's been lots of fun because, of course, people make up all kinds of things, and we, we think that they're made up, only discover they're true. They really are true. And so we have a lot of chances to get to know something more about something, get more acquainted becomes this sort of icebreaker that people get to talk about and say, oh, I didn't know that about you, or I didn't know you had that experience, or I didn't know that, or I thought you were that stripper. Oh, no, I, I, I'm sorry. No, I thought you were that person uh, because, you see, uh, this the fun of getting to know each other better and how it unfolds through getting better acquainted. Well, I want to tell you this. God is very eager for you to get better acquainted with the divine. To get better acquainted in the sense of knowing the intimacy, to knowing in deeper ways the unfolding character of the divine. To really be acquainted to a level where you really have the, the understanding of what it means to be truly one. No separation, but that the very character, the essence, all that is of the divine goodness of God dwells in you because you know what it is. You're acquainted with it. You understand it. You have this wonderful intimacy then with the divine that you truly can say, you know what, I walk out into this world and I live as the unfolding or the revelation of God. Because this is what we're here to do. We're here to express God. That's right, to reveal God. What's your life purpose? We all struggle with that, keep asking questions. Is my life purpose to be a carpenter or is my life purpose to be a plumber or a, a fireman, a policeman? Was it to be a waitress or, or a corporate executive? What is it that's my life purpose? The universal life purpose for all of us is that no matter what we choose in our pathways, we're there to express God, express, reveal, show to the world, reveal the truth, to reveal the light. So it is. This is why we discover how God becomes more wonderful to us. This is something to think God wants to be wonderful to us and wants us to have this kind of intimacy that we say, wow, this divine presence is so real, so powerful. I experience it now in a new way of complete understanding. I feel it's wonderful to know God. It's wonderful to experience God. It's wonderful to express God. Because what happens is many people in our world today are not that acquainted with God. Oh, they know a little bit but they're not really acquainted. And the Spirit of God may be saying, I would love to get better acquainted with you. I would love you to know me more. Uh, we've been journeying in a lifetime of eternal life together, but I want you to understand what it's like to express this divinity of which you've been created in. Our challenge is a lot of people don't really feel that, you know, knowing that much about God is all that important because we know, well, he's the big man in the sky is the concept. He's removed from us, and he's out there always making judgments and punishments and all these kind of ideas. And, you know, that concept is so removed from what, who and what God really is and what God is in our hearts and our lives. So it comes a point for us to begin to understand and get acquainted with the divine. To do so, we must be a seeker, someone really wanting to know. How many of you remember uh, the commercial from the 70s? E.F. Hutton, and it says, inquiring minds want to know, and <gasps> the world stopped, and they all wanted, what, 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 what? You know, we want to know, we want to know, you know, and this is what a seeker is, the seeker is this inquiring mind that says, I want to know, what, what is there, What's, what, what, what do you know about God, what is God doing in your life, what is God revealing, I want to know, I'm going to experience it, I want to, hush, I want to hear it all, I want to discover it, how many of you have been to a party, or maybe uh, you've, uh, been in a social setting, but no one asks a question of you ever, you know? Isn't it kind of strange that they never ask you a question like, how's your day? How's your work? Uh, what's going on in your life? They just kind of start talking and you mix and you mingle and nobody inquired. You walked away and said, wow, I feel like nobody was that interested in me. Nobody really wanted to get 
acquainted with me. So it is in the spirit of God. When's the last time you've asked questions of the divine? When's the last time you became this seeker that says, I want to know to the level that I really want to inquire. I want to ask questions. I want to be this seeker. I want to be this one who is discovering new levels of understanding. I want to know more than I know about God today. I want to know more than I would ever know about God. I want this ongoing experience to unfold for me. That's a continuing of expansion of the knowledge of who and what God is. So the question is, what kind of seeker are you? Are you one of those seekers who's occasional? You know, I might occasionally ask a question or wonder or have a thought. Hmm. Is God really, oh, well, let's not get too detailed. And we kind of move on, that kind of seeker. And then how about maybe you're just a surface seeker. You're just, let, let's not get too deep or too heavy or too theological. Let's just kind of seek God on a surface level, kind of, uh, uh, you know, shallow. That's okay. Let's not get too deep. Or how about one who's really passionate about seeking? Passionate about discovering and to the point that you are so passionate, you are a goal. Your goal is to be a finder, a seeker who is now a finder. You know, sometimes I'll say, Robert, can you help me find uh, my shoes? I, I don't know where I left them. I, yeah, well, you know, he's like, okay, I looked, but I didn't find him. You know, he wasn't that passionate about looking. You know. Did you look at the closet? Well, I, I kind of looked there. Yeah, yeah, I can't. Yeah. You know, did you look here? Did you look there? Yeah, well, okay. You know. And when you're not really passionate, what happens? You don't really find anything, do you? Oh, but tell me, when you're passionate about something and you're going to seek, you're going to seek until you find, aren't you? You're going to rip these things apart. You're going to open up drawers. You're going to pull up closets. You're going to shuffle things all around. You're going to make a mess and tear the bed apart. Doesn't matter, but you're going to find it, right? That's the passionate seeker that says, I am seeking with a goal of finding. Not just seeking that says, you know, okay, whatever. If something pops up, it's okay. And sometimes when we are not that passionate, we can't see all the nuances and the depths of truth that want to unfold for our lives. But when passion arises within us, oh, we want every nugget of truth that's there about God. Let me find more about God's character and God's spirit at work within me, that power of God at work within my life. I want to know it all. I want to seek until I truly find it all. Let me tell you this. Today's churches are filled with seekers but they're not finders. A lot of people just on the surface level saying, I'm seeking. Oh, but if they found, what a revolution we would experience in the realm of spirituality. People who really found God. To the depth that there was a transformation within the life. To the depth that they experienced the intimacy of the divine at work within them. To the depth that they said, I am so hungry for more of that which I found is great for today. What is left out for tomorrow? I want to seek it too. I want to find more and more. Because as your pastor, I want to tell you this. I'm passionate about creating a body of finders. Seekers, yes. But moving to the realm of being a community that we found it. We discovered it. That which we're seeking in truth, we have found and we embrace it, and we live it. And that's what makes us so much more transformational, that we move beyond being a seeker. We move to this place where we uh, true become the true seeker who actually finds that truth. Today's text shares with us so beautifully, you will seek me, and you will find me when you seek me passionately, with determination, with focus. It says, with all your heart. And that's the big difference. In today's world, there's a lot of people who are out there who are not putting all their hearts into the journey of knowing God. It's a surface level experience. It's something that's nice. We know a little bit. We know enough just to say that we uh, are comfortable. But what is the intimate level of understanding a divine presence that work within our lives? In this quietness and in the confidence we seek God, with our whole heart, and we know that we know that we know we will find exactly what we're looking for. That's the beautiful promise that this text is there and saying and unfolding for us. When you seek, you will find if you put that passion into it. All those aha moments, those light bulbs going off in your head, those 
wonderful discoveries of who and what God is will happen for you. They'll be there for you in your day-to-day experience. Because what will happen is that this promise comes to life. That which you seek will be found for you. Now, God's importance is revealed to those who are seekers, and they will have this ever-widening vision. I love this. You're going to be able to see things that you never saw before when you begin to understand the very character of God. Because God is always at work in intimate ways. And sometimes you didn't realize, wait a minute, that was the hand of God. That was God working. I didn't realize, or that was God speaking through that McDonald's employee. Or that was the Lord speaking, the the divine speaking in unfolding ways through my mother on the phone. Or, oh, who was this? You know, and because we begin to see and understand that the Spirit is always at work and always wanting to teach and unfold wisdom, well, we see in a widening vision how God is at work in all things. Past week, I took Robert to the hospital, and uh, we were kind of rushed. It was Tuesday, and I was going to be teaching a 7 o'clock class on conversation with God. And we had a 2.30 appointment downtown at Grady. And when we arrived, the 2.30 appointment for doctor, for the uh, plastic eye surgeon who was going to look at Robert's eye and decide what the future may be for him, uh, it was a very important meeting. We wanted to make sure we spent lots of time with the doctor. When we checked in, she said, I'm sorry to tell you that well, we're going to be running about three hours behind. So your 2.30 Looks like 6.30. Enjoy your stay in the waiting room. Have a seat in one of these wonderful, not-so-comfortable chairs. But just enjoy yourself because it'll be about a three-hour wait. And I began to think, wait, 6.30, 7 o'clock class, trying to get me with the doctor for an hour. It meant to be 7.30, getting through traffic, trying to get through the church. I, I'm going to miss this class that I'm teaching. I won't be able to make it. But I just began to say, you know what? I just release this, and whatever it is, it is. I just know that this will unfold for the highest and best. Just sat down in the waiting room, and all of a sudden the door opened. And here was the doctor Robert had met just two weeks previously. He looked out in the the room, full of patients, all waiting for hours, looked at me and just smiled. Stepped back in the room. A few minutes later, she came out and called Robert's name, and we went in. And we sat down, and there was the plastic surgeon already in the waiting room. That's a miracle. Uh, waiting for us. And then we could sit down and talk. And they did a wonderful evaluation and all kinds of insight. And they decided, by the way, that they're going to remove his left eye. And it's a good thing. So there's no further infections uh, in it. The eye is of no use at this time. It's dead. Uh, so we want to make sure that it's good. Uh, removed and everything's clean to keep the wound going well. So my point was this. I sat there for a moment and realized that doctor's smile was simply the very voice of God saying, I got this. Just chill. Your schedule's going to work out just fine. You'll be there in time. Everything's going to work out great. The doctor just kind of whispered to me as I checked out. She said, I saw you in the waiting room, and something has said, I needed to pull you ahead of the game, so I moved you to the top of the line. And I said, oh, thank you. Thank you. I was really appreciative. She knew nothing about the schedule. She knew nothing about what was going on. But this is when we begin to see how God worked all things together for good. Even in the simplest of things, even where it seems so small and minute, it's like, wait a minute, you mean God works in our day-to-day schedule? God's working in through our day-to-day experiences? Of course. And wanting to see your highest and best unfold for you. So chill and know that God's got it. God's got it under control. But when we get so acquainted with God, well, we would know that. We would know that, wouldn't we? So there'd be no fear and no worry that comes to our lives because our vision would see, wow, this is really amazing how God is unfolding and taking care. Now, we understand that sometimes we don't quite grasp all of there is to say about the infinite uh, presence of the divine that is God. We don't always understand the things that we don't understand. Sometimes, well, we don't make them so important to our lives. We don't understand computers. So, you know what, we just look for the on and off button and call it a day. You know, we don't understand a lot of things. And so because the things we don't understand, they're not that important to you. Been with a group of congregants who, you know, don't know the first thing about Super Bowl. uh, But we go to the Super Bowl and we watch and have a Super Bowl party and we have chips and food and all that kind of stuff. But the game, they're like, you know, uh, what was that? I think it was a touchdown. 
Oh, yay, go, okay. Uh, you know, but if you don't understand, it's not that important to you, right? You don't really care. You're more concerned about the chips, right? What the dip tastes like. What's, you know, we got the food going on here. That's what we're concerned about. Football, what was that? You know, we have to turn to Anissa for coaching. Uh, she will give us the insights. Right. So the things we don't understand, we often dismiss. Sometimes we don't understand God. And we dismiss because we feel, well, it's not really that important. But when we grow in our understanding, the beautiful things that happen for us is that we understand truth. God is truth, and truth sets you free. Truth liberates you. When we understand that, wow, we begin to soar in our life. I want to get acquainted with truth. I want to get acquainted with God. I want to get acquainted to the point where my life is so liberated from any kind of bondage. I feel like I'm walking on air. I'm walking on sunshine, as the song says. I'm just, you know, I'm feeling good. That's what it should be every single day in our spiritual life. That should be the great hymn of the church when we understand that we embrace this truth that is liberating and sets us free. So here's the thing. We develop our wonderful abilities to understand God by doing the work of God. This is how we get more acquainted. The more you do the work of God, the more you understand how God works. Because the work of God is love and grace and compassion, forgiveness. The work of God is unfolding peace and joy and liberating those who've been feeling the cap as a captive of the world around them. Doing the work of God gives us a really a glimpse of who God is. Many an actor will say, I was so delighted to read the play because I learned about the playwright, his character, his insight, his views. Because as he wrote these characters within the play, and I took on the role and began to live it. I understood a little bit more about the perspective of the playwright. So it is in our own spiritual life that the more we do the work of God, the more we understand how God works. The more we get engaged in the fields of compassion, we understand this is the compassion of God. And the more we share the grace and the forgiveness, we understand God's forgiveness is at work in me. And I understand even more of what it means to be uh, in relationship with a God of great forgiveness and power. For the more then that you engage in the work of God, the more you understand. And the more you understand, the more you're able to prove God and prove the very power of God at work within our hearts and our lives. How important this is, because getting to, into the business of proving God is what the church should all be about. That's right. Demonstrating. Being so acquainted so familiar with the power and presence of God that it's at work within our lives on a day-to-day -day basis. It's not saved just for special occasions. With the work of God that we understand, the power of God, the proving of God's wonderful ability, it worked just for special times or moments of crisis. But it's a day-to-day -day experience that we share and ongoing. We begin to understand that we uh, get more acquainted as we begin to demonstrate or prove God to the world around us. How many have been to Costco? You've been to Costco and you may have heard that call of, hey folks, there'll be a demonstration on aisle four over here on the Vitamix. Come on over, everyone gather. I'm going to demonstrate for you. And everybody gathers around and the salesman has his pitch and his wonderful little Madonna mic and he's there showing you all the wonderful things with the mixers and what him have to make soup and it slices and dices and makes julienne fries, all these wonderful things that the wonderful Vitamix will do for you. And you're so excited because you have observed the demonstration. And so it is. When we're demonstrating God, we're doing just the same to the world. Let me demonstrate for you the power and presence of the divine at work. And the more I demonstrate it, the more I understand it. In fact, the man who is demonstrating the Vitamix can do it in his sleep. He's done it so many times. He can turn around and mix this and turn that one in and do this. And he's talking to people and he's mixing around. He's working all kinds of things for all these different levels as he's showing you what this wonderful piece of equipment would do for you in your life but he's so comfortable with it. He's so at ease with it. He's so acquainted with it that he can prove or demonstrate. 
This is the call of the church today that we begin to prove the power of God. For Jesus was one who walked this earth proving the power of God, demonstrating it in all kinds of circumstances. Calling out to Lazarus, who is in the tomb, who has died, who is there already in a place of decay, you might say. But there calls forth from Lazarus, rise up, come forth, calling him to come out of the tomb in a resurrection power. So symbolic for our lives and the story that we too can resurrect from dead moments of faith where we think all is gone and finished, yet the power of God resurrects it in wonderful ways within our lives. Jesus proved the power of God by turning the water into wine. At the wedding feast at Cana, there when the wine ran out, Mary turns to Jesus and says, Do something, in other words. Come on, it's your turn. Do something. And Jesus said, well, wait a minute. It's not my time right now to provide the wine. But Mary says to those servants, do what he instructs you to do. And he takes these purification pots that have been used for the purification of uh, in Jewish traditions, takes that water and turns it into wine, symbolizing abundance for our lives. Turning water that symbolizes a way of thinking, a consciousness, a way of living around rule and regulation in Jewish tradition, now to a sense of abundance. Turning around a moment of lack into now a moment of unlimited abundance, of wine, of proving to the world that the power of God is speaking constantly to us that there is an abundance for you to be experienced. This is why it's so important that we are proving the power of God at all times, that we step into this divine flow of the presence, so acquainted with it, so comfortable with it, that we can prove and we can demonstrate to the world. And what's the best way to prove? God is to first recognize who, what God is. This is how you begin prayer. First step is recognition. You sang it today in the Lord's Prayer. Our creator, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. What was that all about? That's a recognition. That's not starting a dear John letter. Dear God, I'm going to write this letter to you. It's not an address. It's a recognition. Our creator. Wow. Just to, just to recognize the creator's power at work. Who art in heaven in this realm of higher consciousness, a higher understanding, higher truth and enlightenment. Hallowed, holy is your character. Wow, that beginning of recognition is the way we should begin every prayer. Every prayer should begin by, I recognize who, what God is. And when I do, wow, that begins a transformation in my life. Because if I recognize the power and the presence of God, first and foremost, then my words that follow are going to be totally different. We can start out prayers that say, Oh, God, oh, God, I don't know. I'm not sure. I, I, I don't think you're really going to be able to hear me. But, you know, I'm going to try anyway. And I'm going to do it in desperation. And I'm going to pray this way because I, well, you know what kind of prayer that is. Prayer of doubt, fear, and faith, of faithlessness. But when there's recognition that says, first of all, let me recognize there's one power and it is almighty and is ever present within my life right here and right now. Doesn't your next words change? Because once you proclaim that, you can say, and in that power, I now claim with authority this prayer answered. And we wrap it up by saying, and so it is. Done deal. Over with. Faith is so accomplished. Right? This is why the most important thing we can do is to begin to get acquainted with God is to begin recognition. What is recognition? It's praise. Now the scripture says, enter into the courts, enter into thy presence through thanksgiving and pray. Beautiful psalmist writing this thought that we enter into the, we reconnect, we sort of enter into a divine presence of an awareness that's always there. It's not we're coming to something. It's that we're entering into this sort of like aha moment. It happens through praise. Praising God by we do so, we expand our consciousness, our awareness of the presence of God. We begin to open up our mind, blow your mind to new levels like, whoa, let's just stop for a moment and praise God because God is almighty. 
And let's just recognize and praise that God is ever present. Whoa, and let's think about this, that God is all knowing and knows the desires of our heart before we even ask. Whoa, doesn't that just expand your mind right then and there? You see, that helps you enter in to a new awareness of the divine, of how good God is. For God's glory has existed from the beginning of time. You can't subtract or add to it. Your praise is not adding. It's just creating an awareness or an increasing your own understanding and appreciation with, of God. You're getting more acquainted with God by praising. That's right. You're recognizing. You're acknowledging. When you praise, you recognize, you acknowledge, and you get even more acquainted. You go, yeah, you know what? That's right. God is with me, never leaving me, nor forsaking me. Ooh, that's changing everything right now when you're going through a crisis. Oh, let me just stop for a moment and praise and recognize. And that is this divine power knows the need, everything about it before I've even asked. And it's already prepared the desire of my heart. Wow, let me just change my whole attitude then in this moment because I recognize and through praise understand more. But let me tell you this. You don't praise God to flatter God. It's not like God is saying, excuse me, <laughs> I'm a little insecure right now. Could you praise me? You know, excuse me, I just did something wonderful. You know, where are you? Come on. Let's have some nice words coming from you all here over here because I don't hear the praise section going on. We think that somehow we praise God to flatter God and that's not, trust me, God doesn't need anything. God doesn't need your praises. That would be like a monarch or a king or somebody of a earthly context that may say who has that ego issues that may need to be flattered. But your praise simply brings his beauty to you, his essence to you, his character to you, and it moves it up. Oh, that's why I praise. We don't praise for God. The praise work we do is to help us to wake up, to acknowledge, to be acquainted with, to recognize all these wonderful things. Because what happens is, as we move then through praise and recognition, these truths up to the forefront of our thinking, it moves to the forefront, it begins to shape what comes next in our thoughts. Because we praise God to say, this is what I know about God. This is how acquainted I am with God. This is what I recognize. This is the power and presence. And now it's in the forefront of my thinking. And now it shapes every thought that comes to us from there forward. How important it is. We do this, we understand how the beauty of God unfolds within our lives. For praise is for us, not for God. Everything is already God's. Praise helps develop the muscles of our inner power of discernment. Discernment. Now, what is that? That is to see without judgment of good or bad, but to recognize what is, to discern. Let me see, what's going on here? You know what I mean? Let's really talk about what's going on here. Get in the midst of a conflict, you know, and Let's have a moment of discernment. Let's not choose sides, good or bad. Let's just find and discern what is really, really happening. You see, that's what discernment is. And when we acknowledge and recognize the power of God, we're better at discerning scenarios and circumstances in our world around us. That we begin to be, see the goodness of God unfolding in scenarios, in circumstances that maybe we didn't see before because we weren't able to discern it. But now that we're so acquainted with the character of God to the point that we recognize it, that we give praise to it, we suddenly now are able to discern and see it in new ways as ever before. And through this recognition, we have a better ability to express our faith and to grow. I want you to say this and understand this, that only good can come to you through God. OK, God is only going to bestow good upon you. I want you to say this with me. I know that only good can come from God. Say it out loud. I know that only good can come from God. Okay? That's a big get acquainted moment. If you're getting acquainted with God, know that God is not a bestower of something in your life that's not good. Okay? Problems, challenges. Oh, God's bringing me challenges. You say. Oh, God's brought all these problems on my lap. Oh, do you know that God is really punishing me through this experience I'm having with my husband, my wife, my partner, whatever it may be. You see, 
we kind of claim that. But let me tell you this. God is only the giver of the goodness because that's all God knows. God is good. Good is God. God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. When we understand that, what happens is we become more acquainted with the good that's available to our life. We can't imagine the infinite amount of goodness that is there to be bestowed in our life for us to receive, for us to experience. So what happens then is the more we become acquainted with God, the more we recognize God, the more we offer this praise of God, what happens is we understand the truth that we don't need to be afraid of anything in this world. What? No fear? Are you kidding? Really? We're, we're going to live in a world where there's no fear? We have nothing to fear? Are you sure? Well, uh, I can name about six things we can fear. Spiders, snakes, uh, you know, bugs, uh, you know, our mother-in-law, uh, you know, I don't know what it is. You can go on through the list of all kinds of things that you might say, I need to fear. But in God, there's nothing to fear. When we awaken to this wonderful truth that God is the giver of all good for our lives, and we surrender our lives to this wonderful understanding, we're so acquainted with the good that is God. And we know that all things, no matter what's happening, it's happening for our highest and best. We become then acquainted with this divine power that nothing can disturb us. We say, I abide securely in God's peace and presence because I know God's peace and presence is all good. And so I'm not afraid. There's no need for fear. There's nothing to be afraid of. I speak this perfect peace at all times, and I need not be frightened of any experiences. Because what happens is this whole text is inviting us. When you seek with all your heart, you're going to find, you're going to find this divine power at work within your life and be so familiar with it, so acquainted with it, that you can recognize it at any moment. You can sing its praises. You can acknowledge it. It will lift you up. It will re remove you from the elements of fear. And this power will now operate through you. How beautiful it is that we become so acquainted with the power of God so familiar with it, so comfortable with it, that we become like Jesus. You know that? We're supposed to become like Jesus? We're supposed to be Jesus in this moment? That's what the whole gospel is trying to unfold for us? So then we would be the one who would speak to the storm in the midst of our seas that's tossing our boat of our life all around and say, peace be still, and be able to calm the storm. We would be the kind of person that is so acquainted with the power of God that when those things of fear, like as symbolized by the demons that Jesus encountered, he cast them out and removed them, and we too would be this very same, but we'd be so acquainted with this. We'd be so acquainted with God that the, God becomes our most wonderful thing to us, wonderful experience to us, the most wonderful essence to us the most wonderful feeling to us of anything whatsoever. This is the journey of knowing. Isn't it time we become more acquainted with the divine? Isn't it time to become more familiar with all that is of God? But when we do, amazing things unfold for us. Amen.